The story begins as we see a hero defeating the demon lord, leading the humans to victory, and all of mankind celebrating. But after three months, in the demon realm, we see the demons are holding a tournament to see who will be the next demon lord. However, we see a man named Halleck participating in the tournament, and he takes out his opponents with just his bare hands. We meet Vermilio, the organizer of the tournament, and one of the four demon generals. Her assistant Han shows her footage from the preliminary rounds, and he notes that the participants have an average level of 45, which is a record high for them, so Vermilio has high expectations. But when she starts watching the fights, she soon notices Halleck. Han notes that Halleck is the favorite to win, but Vermilio starts freaking out, wondering why a human was allowed to participate. Han mentions anyone was allowed to participate, but Vermilio thinks it should have been obvious that humans weren't allowed since they are their mortal enemies. Han tells her not to worry, showing her Halleck's victory interview, where he claims to despise humans, and that he wants to destroy them all. Vermilio thinks he's obviously lying, thinking they are in trouble, but Han reveals the deep green contract, which all participants have signed, and it nullifies all attacks that are made against people outside the ring. Vermilio is still suspicious, and thinks Halleck's plan must be to take out all their potential demon lord candidates, but as she watches his fight, Halleck helps his opponent up, and even compliments him. Vermilio gets pissed off, wondering what he's after, and she thinks that the demons would never accept him, but we see the crowd cheering for him. Vermilio loses it, setting the castle on fire, and she tells Han that they need to eliminate Halleck, but Han tells her that the deep green contract also nullifies attacks made against the participants, and he adds that Halleck is level 99, so Vermilio ends up blowing up the tower in frustration. Vermilio thinks Halleck is definitely going to win since he's so strong, but Han suggests they can change the format of the tournament, saying they could make the next round a card stacking competition, and he even plans to give Halleck the more glossy cards. Meanwhile in the human realm, we meet Asta, a demon spy working for Vermilio, who is on a mission to find out more about Halleck. But when she investigates the village, she doesn't find a single person. Back at the arena, the participants are given a desk and deck of cards, as the next round begins. The announcer explains that only the top 10 will advance, and we see Halleck struggling. Vermilio gets excited seeing this, but Halleck suddenly puts his hands together, trying to focus. He raises his hands, creating a powerful gust of wind, and knocking down everyone else's card stack. He assembles his house with incredible speed, and he is the first to complete the challenge. Vermilio claims that he broke the rules, so he should be disqualified, but a participant named Canrose disagrees, thinking that building a house of cards was just an analogy for building up your castle while wiping out your opponents, testing both offense and defense. The other participants believe his explanation, and the arena erupts into chaos as they all start trying to destroy each other's house of cards, while Vermilio burns with rage as she thinks this is all a part of Halleck's plan to get the other candidates to fight each other. Meanwhile, we see Asta report back to her twin sister, Ista. We learn that the sisters possess a special ability to telepathically communicate, through fulfilling the condition that they both drink coffee. Asta wonders about the tournament, and we see that Halleck is dominating every contest despite Vermilio's attempts to make him lose. Vermilio decides to disguise herself as one of the judges, so she can deliberately lower his score, but it's a cooking round, and Halleck prepares an amazing dessert. As Vermilio tastes it, she is just unable to resist, and she gives him a perfect score, allowing Halleck to move on to the semifinals. We see Halleck messing around with Kenrose, refusing to show him a picture, while Hyura, one of the other candidates, thinks they're both idiots. Kenrose manages to grab the picture, and we see it's Halleck with his brother class. Meanwhile, Ista reports to Vermilio the information her sister has gathered, and it turns out Halleck has a huge bounty on his head, and is considered the worst criminal in all of human history, because he killed his own brother, who was the hero that defeated the demon lord. Ista goes on to mention that her sister visited three towns, and all of them were abandoned. But at that moment, Han frantically rushes in, and reports that Castle Urim has fallen. Vermilio thinks the humans are responsible, but Han tells her that Urim was attacked by strange winged knights, and that the Lord sacrificed himself to save his people. Vermilio and Ista become worried that the humans may know about their capital, and that they might be attacked next. Vermilio is determined to get rid of Halleck, and we learn that they've planned a race as the next contest. Han tells her that he has prepared a unique steed for Halleck. 
The participants enter the arena on their steeds, and we see that Halleck is mounted on a small, adorable beast. Vermilia worries that this might cause Halleck's popularity to spike, and we see that the audience cheers for Halleck even more. The announcer named Rocco explains that there are several traps on the course, and the first four racers to arrive back in the arena will move to the finals. The race begins, and all the participants dart off, leaving Halleck behind. Halleck struggles to get his steed to move, as Hyura thinks that the management screwed Halleck over on purpose. Halleck gets off his steed, as the front runners enter the obstacle course. He tries to encourage it, and inspires it with motivational words. We see the other racers going through the obstacle, while many get taken up by the traps, as we learn Han made it extra hard to make sure they get rid of Halleck. Hyura tries to take out Kenrose, who is in the lead, and Han is certain that the next demon lord will be one of them. Halleck suddenly zooms across the track, and we see that he is running along his steed. Vermilio urges that he be disqualified for cheating, but Han says they can't do it, assuring her that the obstacle course will take him out. But Halleck overcomes the obstacle course with ease, breaking the traps in the process, and annoying Vermilio. They panic, thinking the suspension bridge might be a good way to make Halleck lose the race, so they plan to rig the bridge to explode when Halleck is in the middle of it, and cover the rest in oil to make him slip. However, as the staff is rigging the bridge, one of them slips on the oil, and crashes into the explosives, causing the bridge to explode prematurely. Vermilio is furious, telling Han that the plan wouldn't work, unless the bridge explodes while Halleck is on it. True to her word, Halleck leaps all the way across to the other side, and we see that he is now carrying his mount. Halleck quickly closes the gap, and runs past the frontrunners. Kenrose is inspired by Halleck's speed, so he gets off his horse, claiming he has the fastest legs in the empire, and he sprints ahead. Kenrose closes the gap with Halleck, and the two race toward the finish line. It's a close call, but Halleck manages to take the win. Halleck praises Kenrose, and the crowd cheers for them as they celebrate. Ista enters the office with news, and tells Vermilio what the reconnaissance squadron reported back. We learn that they sent spies into Castle Urim, but the spies didn't see any humans in the castle. The squadron also reported that there were 103 winged knights in the castle, along with their leader. Vermilio is surprised that the knights captured Urim despite their small numbers. The winged knights are a mystery to them, but she is convinced that they are from the human realm. As she tries to figure out what to do, Azudra, one of the other four demon generals appears. We learn that Vermilio is filling in for Azudra, because he was badly injured. Azudra tries to propose an idea, but collapses midway. However, he continues on, and suggests that the final match of the tournament be to retake Castle Urim, saying that this way, they can kill two birds with one stone. Vermilio does not trust Halleck, and Azudra tells her that his idea will reveal Halleck's real motivations, saying they need to know if Halleck is a threat. Vermilio asks him what they would do if Halleck turns out to be a threat, as she is worried that Halleck will turn on them during the battle. Azutra pulls out a deep green ring from his sleeve, and explains that it will prevent the competitors from harming one another. Since they don't know what might happen, they decide that they should send someone strong with the competitors, and they agree that it should be Vermilio, as she is determined to risk her life to defeat Halleck if he becomes a threat. Five days later, we see the four competitors put on their deep green rings, as Rocco explains the mission. She tells them that one of the management staff will be responsible for keeping them safe, introducing them to Anna, who is actually Vermilio in disguise. Vermilio gives a short speech, and Hyura thinks that she looks familiar. Halleck looks at her, and recognizes her as the judge from the cooking contest, and she reluctantly shakes his hand. We see Asta in a field deep inside the human realm, as she compares it to the Empire. We learn that the Empire is covered in an invisible toxin, and all the people live inside a barrier to stay safe. Meanwhile, Vermilio and the four competitors leave for Castle Urim, as Asta also embarks on her journey. Hyura dispatches several bug-like creatures, but even more monsters appear around them. Kenrose explains that the monster bugs were created by the toxin covering the land. A horde charges at Hyura, as she slices through the monsters. We meet Dorsh, the fourth finalist, as he offers to help, saying he can take care of all the monsters at once. He explains that if he eats beans, he can create an extremely strong barrier. He eats a bean, and a powerful energy starts to radiate from him. 
As the monsters get closer, Vermilio asks how long the barrier takes to activate, and is shocked when Dorsch tells her it takes 30 minutes. Realizing that 30 minutes would be far too long, she uses her powers to incinerate the monsters. Seeing the display of power, Hyura's suspicions are confirmed. They arrive at a rest area that's protected by a barrier, where Vermilio notices that Halleck is not exhausted like the others. She wonders if he has incredible stamina, or if he is immune to the toxin. In a separate room, Kenrose and Hyura discuss Anna. Hyura thinks Anna is actually Lady Vermilio, saying she must be keeping tabs on Halleck. At that moment, Vermilio walks past the room and overhears their conversation. She insists that they are mistaken, claiming she is just Anna from the management. She asks them not to mention this to Halleck, and Hyura can tell she really is Vermilio. Later, they all have a meal prepared by Halleck, and Vermilio is irritated, thinking that Halleck is showing off. She unwillingly tries the food, but finds it to be delicious. Back at the capital, Azudra and Han are playing a game. Rocco informs them about the status of the competitors, and tells them that they are taking an underground route towards Castle Urim to avoid a storm. Han adds that the toxin is more potent down there, and spawns too many monsters. Ista is concerned, and suggests sending troops as backup, but Azutra explains that because of how Vermilio's powers work, more troops would only get in her way. He also mentions that reducing the forces at the capital is risky, since the knights could attack at any time. Azudra assures her that Vermilio is quite strong, but admits that he is a bit worried too. In the underground passage, Vermilio tells them not to bother with any monsters that are not directly in front of them as they sprint through the passage. The competitors are about to get surrounded again, as Hyura warns Vermilio of a huge monster behind her. We learn that this particular monster is a New World life form, which appears in places where the toxin is potent. New World life forms attack everything and get stronger through the constant battles. Halleck decides to take it on, and the others notice that Halleck has a weapon with him now, noting he had been fighting barehanded all this time. Halleck jumps up and kicks the monster, sending it flying through a wall. He draws his sword to celebrate the victory, and we see that it's quite small. The monster is defeated with just the kick, and Vermilio burns its corpse to be safe. She wonders if a new world life form appeared in the human realm too, since Halleck seemed familiar with what it was. The group comes out of the passage and spots the castle. An intelligence operative reveals himself and leads them to a hidden entrance into the castle. The operative opens the gate, and Vermilio cautions them reminding them about the rules before they go in. Hyura thinks that Kenrose and Dorsch are pretending to be lazy and planning to jump in at the last minute to take the win. We see that Kenrose actually wants Halleck to win and Dorsch just wants to leave, but Hyura plans to beat Halleck by attacking the enemy leader before Halleck can make his move. In a flashback, we see Vermilio and Azutra talking about the first time he met Halleck. It was just after he had finished creating the deep green contract and was visiting the castle. He saw Halleck arrive at the castle and made his way in easily, triggering Azutra's traps, but it had no effect on him and Azutra ended up getting injured instead. We learn that Azutra trusts Halleck because Halleck could have killed him if he wanted to. Back in the present, Vermilio still distrusts Halleck as they arrive inside the destroyed castle. They spot the knights in an opening and Hyura tells the others to handle the knights while she fights the leader. Before they can stop her, she rushes toward the leader, and the rest follow behind. They fight off the knights, and Hyura gets close to the leader, when suddenly he attacks with incredible speed, slicing off her arm. The others are shocked, as she falls to the ground. The knight leader is about to kill Hyura, when Halleck calls out his name, Edel. Edel is surprised that Halleck was able to recognize him, and he removes his helmet, seemingly pleased to meet Halleck. He explains that he managed to retain his personality because of his exceptionally high awakening rate, and that he watched his friends suffer through the awakening process, wishing he had lost his personality instead. Vermilio confirms that the winged knights are humans, and suspects they used sorcery to change their bodies. We learn that Edel gained his powers through the awakening process, and that he grows stronger with each battle. At that moment, countless winged knights approach, as Edel explains that they plan to invade the demon realm. A knight attacks Vermilio, but she instantly burns it, thinking that even with the awakening, a single hero is a much greater threat than the winged knights, but Edel reveals that they have awakened as heroes. 
we learn that the last hero was born 255 years ago, and Halleck and Kles existing at the same time was a surprise to everyone. Vermilio is confused because the knights are not strong enough to be heroes, but fears that they might get stronger with time, and if multiple heroes emerge, then the empire would be doomed. The knights surround the demons, and as Edel is giving his speech, Hyura sneaks up from behind, slicing his wing off. We see that Hyura has regenerated her arm, as she is a member of the Ahad tribe, which is composed of demons with strong regenerative powers. Hyura engages Edel in combat, as Vermilio guesses that Hyura didn't immediately kill Edel, so that she could get a chance to gauge Halleck's allegiance. Hyura fights Edel, and slices off his other wing, thinking that the hero abilities aren't so strong after just awakening. Vermilio realizes that the knights are still weak. She uses a multi-summoning technique to summon massive fire attacks, taking out a number of the knights. She stops herself from blowing all of them up, because she needs to consider the tournament finals. Edel is amazed at her power, and Hyura tells him that she's just a staff member for management, surprising him even further. Hyura lies to Edel, and makes him believe that the demon empire is filled with people as strong as Vermilio. She tells Edel to apologize, but he refuses, so she goes to strike him down. However, Halleck blocks her sword, and Vermilio thinks he is their enemy. Halleck explains that killing winged knights is a bad idea, but at that moment, a feather pierces through Edel's body. We see another winged knight flying over the battlefield, who was the one who attacked Edel. Edel mentions that the pathway was nearly finished, but before anyone can make sense of it, Halleck yells for everyone to get back, as the ground collapses beneath them. The group falls into an underground area, and we learn that it contains a barrier stone that keeps the toxins out, and a gate created with an ancient spatial teleportation spell. Kenrose guesses that the human realm lies at the other side of the gate, as the gate starts to draw everything into it. Vermilio explains that the spell has failed, and the gate is out of control, so they need to close it. At that moment, Dorsch activates his barrier to protect them from getting sucked in. He explains that his max power barrier is usually bigger, but the gate is even absorbing his barrier. Vermilio realizes that the gate is drawing power from the barrier stones, and plans to destroy it. She runs out of Dorsch's barrier to reach the stone, and she blasts it, but only manages to make a crack. She prepares to fire again, but she gets hit by debris, and she is about to get sucked in. Halleck suddenly appears, and runs toward Vermilio, who blasts the stone again, causing it to break. Halleck grabs her hand, but they both get sucked in. The stone shatters completely, and the gate closes. When Vermilio regains consciousness, and wakes up on a beautiful beach, wondering where she is. Vermilio is amazed by the ocean, and thinks they've been transported to the edge of the continent. She stands in the water, and notes that there's no toxin there. She is grateful that she landed in a place with plenty of resources, as she sits by a river, and wonders where Halleck is. She finds Halleck back at the beach, and we see he has built an entire house. A talking bird distracts Vermilio, and Halleck finds her hiding in the bushes. Vermilio doesn't trust him, so she prepares for a fight. Halleck explains that he built the house as a base of operation, since they can't get back to the demon realm anytime soon. Halleck reveals that they're on island, and he is certain because he went around the entire area to check. Vermilio wonders if there's a way back, when it suddenly starts raining. Halleck and the bird run for the house, while Vermilio thinks that at least the Empire is safe from the threat of Halleck. Vermilio refuses to go inside the house, but Halleck ends up picking her up, and taking her inside. Halleck thinks they should build a boat to get off the island. Vermilio panics, thinking she can't let Halleck go back to the demon realm, but has a change of heart, when she realizes that Halleck has had plenty of opportunities to kill her, but hasn't done it, choosing to help her instead. She wonders if Halleck is truly an ally, as they set out to find food. Back at the capital, Azutra wonders about the hero awakening spell. He decides to send a search party to find Vermilio, so she can help fight the humans. Han informs him that most of their soldiers are deployed elsewhere, making it impossible to gather a large search party. Azutra tells them that they will use a locator spell to find her, explaining that the spell is a safety measure that will let them track her location. Han says that they need something belonging to Vermilio to perform the spell, as Azutra admits that he tried to take some of Vermilio's hair when she cut it, but failed. Ista tells them that she kept some of Vermilio's hair as part of a custom. They lay out a map, and use the hair in a wooden figure to perform the spell. 
The wooden figure moves off the map, suggesting that Vermilio is not on the continent. Back on the island, Vermilio is fishing on a rock, as she ponders whether she should simply ask Halleck about his motive, but imagines that if he reveals himself as the enemy, and they fight, she would lose. The talking bird tells her that she has caught a fish, and Vermilio tries to reel it in. She struggles against a small fish, and the line ends up breaking. Halleck dives into the water to help catch the fish, but brings back a completely different animal. Vermilio wakes up in the house the next morning, and is still unsure of what she should do. A strange man arrives at the door with a half-eaten breakfast. He tells Vermilio that the village chief had sent it for her, and she is surprised that there is a village on the island. Vermilio asks the man to take her to the village, so he shows it to her. They walk around the village, and we learn that these people are the only ones living on the island. The talking bird finds Vermilio and clings to her, informing her that Halleck is out trying to build a boat. She rushes to find him before he escapes the island and spots him in the forest. She watches as Halleck exudes a strong aura before chopping down multiple trees with a single blow. He ends up breaking his axe and continues chopping down trees with his bare hands. Vermilio and the bird try to hide behind a rock, but Halleck finds them. She asks him if he has any new information and is relieved to find that he doesn't. She spots something on a nearby beach and rushes out to discover the ruins of an ancient castle. Halleck tells her that they are everywhere and guesses the island may have been prosperous at some point. Halleck quickly builds the boat and Vermilio remarks that the quality of his work is lower than usual. At that moment, the village chief shows up, seemingly upset, and tells them that they need to talk. The village chief leads them into the forest, and they follow him cautiously. They are later surrounded, and the chief reveals that he's brought them to a welcome party. Vermilio admits that she is surprised, and appreciates the warm welcome. We learn that Halleck has been exchanging his services for supplies from the village to care for Vermilio. The village chief tells Vermilio about the Great Witch, saying she could help them find their way back to the continent. We learn that the Great Witch lives on a mountain and has a wealth of knowledge. Vermilio wants to meet her, but the chief tells her that it's not possible because the mountain is protected by a magical barrier. Vermilio spends the day with the villagers, waiting for the Great Witch to come down from the mountain. She tells Halleck that she is mentally exhausted because of the villagers, but appreciates their kindness. Halleck compares them to the demons, but Vermilio tells him that demons are evil, mentioning a barbarian tribe that eats people, along with other tribes in the empire. Vermilio asks Halleck why he saved her, and he replies that he did it because she was his friend, and that he was grateful that the demons even accepted a human like him. Halleck reveals that all his old human friends had become enemies, and that he had been all alone. Vermilio asks Halleck if Edel was his friend, and Halleck confirms this, saying that Edel was a great person. They head back into the house, and Vermilio asks Halleck what he would do when they return, and if he would truly fight the knights, knowing they were his old friends. But he says he has a score to settle. He explains that once a human is awakened, they are no longer human, but simply a weapon that follows the king's orders, and Halleck fears they will attack every other race if they aren't stopped. Back at Castle Urim, we see the other competitors fending off monsters, waiting for the management staff to arrive, when suddenly, more winged knights show up. They talk amongst themselves, and Hyura thinks that these knights have high awakening rates, because they are able to speak. Hyura tells them that Edel told them everything, so one of the knights asks her if she knows their end goal, asking her where their boss is. Hyura attacks him, but it gets blocked, and she shifts her attention to their archer. A third knight blasts her with a fireball, and she retreats as more knights appear. Hyura and Dorsch plan to fend off the knights and allow Kenrose to escape so he can tell the management staff what happened. A voice echoes through the chamber, telling them to stop, and we see Ista and Han appear. Ista jumps down to protect them, slicing through the knights, while Han puts up a barrier for protection. Ista tells them they brought help, and they all make a run for it. The knights chase them to a different area, and they become surrounded. At that moment, Azudra arrives with Rocco. The knights are wary of Azudra, sensing his power, but one of them insults him, causing him to get angry. We learn that Azudra is worried about people fearing him, so he tries to hide his anger. He urges the humans to leave, and suggests that they learn to coexist and avoid fighting. The humans are appalled at the suggestion, but Azudra tells them that they have coexisted peacefully in the past. During his exposition, a knight attacks him, 
revealing that they were ordered by the king. So Azutra realizes that he has no choice. He unleashes his power as giant vines emerge from the ground, instantly defeating and capturing all of the knights. The humans think that he must be the boss, but Azutra tells them that he is just one of the four generals. The group is stunned by Azutra's power, and we learn that he can manipulate any tree in the demon empire, and that he considers himself to be the weakest of the four demon generals. Azutra tells the captured knight that he is just another citizen, and that the castles they destroyed were just two of many, making the knight think that defeating the demons would be a lot harder than he thought. Azutra urges them to surrender, and a knight remarks that he doesn't sound like a demon, since they thought the demons were supposed to be evil. Ista senses a presence, and an arrow flies toward Azutra, but he deflects it. We see more knights shooting arrows from the castle walls, so Han puts up a barrier for protection. Ista realizes that they are aiming for the captured knights to kill them, and Hyera notes that it's just like what happened to Edel. The other knights disappear, and Azutra asks the surviving knight what happened. We learn that the heroes grow stronger by accumulating experience on the battlefield, and that they are going to endlessly attack the demon empire until they are stronger than all of them. The knight lifts his sword, as he says that heroes don't die, and are born over and over again. He takes his own life, and the knight's corpses disappear from the battlefield. We see them get resurrected inside a castle in the human realm, where we meet the human king, who tells the knights how evil the demons are. We see Asta spying in the castle, confused when she sees the knights magically spawn. She suspects the knights are preparing for a war council, as they all fly off again. Back at the battlefield, Azutra shows appreciation for the others, as Han sets up a barrier using a stone, to protect them from the toxin. They all rest as Ista receives a message from Asta, informing her about what she saw, and confirming that the knights were indeed resurrecting. The group has an emergency discussion to assess the situation, and Rocco explains all the problems the eastern region currently faces, starting with the most important. We see the problems are the disappearance of Vermilio, the human threat, the monsters in the east, the vacant demon lord position, and Halleck. Rocco goes on to explain the threat from other nearby powers in the region, with the northern powers being the most worrisome, and the humans from the east as the least. The others think that humans are ranked too low, and we learn that humans are the weakest race amongst all the other races, except for their hero. Azudra, taking everything into account, ranks the humans at a threat level greater than Triple S. We learn that more than half of the Empire's troops are posted at the northern defense line, and if the humans grow stronger, there won't be enough troops to defend against them. Azutra shares a strategy to nullify the humans' ability to resurrect, explaining that the ability comes from a spell, so they should kill the spellcaster, who is the human king. Han asks him how he is so sure, and we learn that a long time ago, Azutra fought a hero capable of reviving, and discovered that it was because of the king's magic. The spell is similar to Azutra's deep green contract, but stronger, and it allows awakened heroes to resurrect at the human king's feet. Ista asks how the human king is able to use such advanced magic, and Azutra figures that they must have another type of awakened being, explaining that if a hero is the combat type, then the king must be a support type. Azutra says that for now, they should prioritize defending against the next attack, and then try to retake the castle. After that, they will send an elite force to kill the human king. We see the demons working to reinforce the castle, as Kamros tells Dorsch that he doesn't like fighting, but Dorsch tells him that they don't have a choice. Hyura and Ista worry about Asta, and we learn that Asta was trained by Hyura. Azutra returns to the place where the gate was hidden, saying the passageway may not have completely disappeared, so if they reopen it, they will find Vermilio. But he says that he can't open a gate big enough for them to get through, so he gives Han some items instead, including a deep green pathfinder, a magic wand that points in the direction of the Empire, along with a letter explaining its function. Azutra opens a small gate, and Han passes the items through it. We see that Azutra is drained and exhausted from opening the gate. On the island, the talking bird discovers the items. We find Vermilio trying to cook a meal, but isn't satisfied with the taste. She notices the fire is about to burn out, and the bird returns with more sticks to burn. We see the bird throwing in the sticks, as well as the items that it found, but Vermilio is just glad that the fire is back. After everything Halleck has told her about his past, Vermilio sees him in a new light and is no longer suspicious of him. 
She is interrupted when a villager comes up to inform her of the Great Witch's arrival at the village. Vermilio runs off, telling the villager to let the others know where she's going. At the village, Vermilio arrives to find out the witch has already left. She's frustrated at herself for being too slow, but Halleck enters with the villager, who apologizes and reveals that she is late because he took a nap on his way. The village chief reassures them that he told the witch about their situation and that she has voided her barrier to allow them to visit her. Vermilio and Halleck head to the witch's residence with the bird, who we learn is named Peewee. When the group gets to the witch's house, they immediately sense the monstrous aura surrounding it. Vermilio is intimidated, but she continues forward. At the top of the mountain, the group is greeted by a creature similar to Peewee, and they meet a beautiful woman who we learn is the Great Witch. Halleck introduces himself to the witch, who says that since they helped the villagers, she is willing to aid them in getting back home. The witch tells them that the continent they seek lies in the northwest. This intrigues Vermilio as she realizes there may be more continents out there. The witch then looks at Halleck, advising him not to rush himself and leave unprepared. She tells them to prepare rations and a sturdy ship to withstand the storms. She also tells them to catch a rare sea creature named the Korstag, to help guide them through a troublesome stretch of the ocean. She shows them what it looks like, and Vermilio realizes it's the creature they caught back at the beach. Halleck runs off to catch the Korstag, while the witch offers Vermilio a place to stay for the night. Vermilio confronts the witch, asking about her identity since she is different from the island's residents and seems to possess great knowledge. The witch brushes off her suspicions and instead tells Vermilio to focus on her own problems. She warns her that Halleck is far more dangerous than she can imagine, revealing that Halleck has the potential to bring about a great calamity. Back at the village, the villagers have finished building and loading the ship, and Halleck captures three core stags for the journey but releases two of them, keeping one for their trip. Halleck and Vermilio bid the villagers farewell and thank them for their hospitality throughout their stay. The witch meanwhile explains to Halleck that the ship will run with the help of a box that Vermilio's magic can power up. If the box breaks, they will have to row the rest of the way. After saying her goodbyes to Peewee, Vermilio is ready to board. The two set off on their journey back as the villagers wave at them. The witch ponders over what choices Vermilio will make but is confident that she will overcome any challenges that she will face. On their journey, Halleck mentions how the witch looks like Vermilio, and she admits that she suspects that the witch is from their kingdom but wouldn't tell her anything. Suddenly, Vermilio notices Peewee pop out of a barrel, excitedly telling her it decided to come with her. Vermilio is furious, thinking the journey is too dangerous for him, until she sees he has a letter for her. The letter is from the witch and states that Peewee would make a great companion for the journey as it has experienced traveling with the witch, and its body is surprisingly durable. She also advises Vermilio to relax and pat Peewee's fluffy body when she wants to calm down. Halleck welcomes Peewee on board but Vermilio is still unconvinced and demands they turn around to send Peewee back, when she is suddenly interrupted by a giant octopus that emerges from the ocean. Halleck gets ready to fight it, but Vermilio stops him and uses the box to propel them safely away from the monster. She then yells at Peewee to return, but Halleck convinces her to let it stay, saying he will keep Peewee safe. She remembers the witch's advice and agrees on the condition that they send Peewee back if it gets too dangerous. The crew continues their journey until they reach the stretch of sea that the witch warned them about. As instructed, they tie the core stag to the ship and release it into the water, and it takes them in the right direction, leading them safely out of the fog. They continue without much trouble until they encounter a storm and end up being pulled into a whirlpool. The giant octopus also re-emerges to add to their troubles, and Halleck gets ready to take it on. The octopus attacks, and Halleck recklessly launches himself at it, landing a strong punch. However, it has no effect on the octopus. When Vermilio tries to help, Halleck stops her, telling her to escape while he fends off the monster. Vermilio protests at first, but upon seeing Halleck's determined look, she decides to listen to him. She guides the ship out of the whirlpool as Halleck continues fighting. We see Halleck get bitten by the monster as it wraps its tentacles around him. Vermilio watches helplessly as the monster pulls Halleck underwater. She desperately calls for Halleck to come back up but gets no response. The storm subsides while Vermilio and Peewee wait for Halleck, finally accepting that he is gone. Vermilio notices the continent in the distance and arrives at the shore, only to find Halleck, who somehow survived and made it to the continent before her. 
Halleck apologizes and explains that when he got sucked into the whirlpool after fending off the monster, he tried to escape and found his way to the continent. Vermilio yells at Halleck for his recklessness but expresses her appreciation towards him for risking his life for them. She then forbids him from making any solo moves and storms off toward the ship to start unloading. They get their stuff, release the core stag into the sea, and then head further into the continent in search of a village where they can get a map. Vermilio senses a presence and stops, thinking that Halleck might be responsible, until a fireball flies at her from the forest. Soon, they are surrounded by the natives who try to capture them. Vermilio notices they are weak and timid and decides to comply with them. The barbarians shackle them with wooden cuffs and lead them to their home. Vermilio notices how the place and its people are in rough shape. The captors explain that the kingdom of Aril used to be peaceful and thriving but was brought down by only 50 barbarians from the Tofman tribe. We learn that the Tofman tribe suddenly powered up, and their king gained unimaginable power. That the Tofman tribe took over and cursed the Aralians to look like monsters. They force the tribe into heavy labor and mercilessly punish anyone who doesn't meet the quota by making them find more slaves. Vermilio realizes they captured her group for the same reason and calls them despicable. The Aralian admits it's wrong, but he is desperate to protect his friends as they run into the Aralian princess. She notices Vermilio's group and demands the Aralian soldiers to release them, telling them that she doesn't approve of their actions, no matter how desperate they are to save the tribe. At that moment, the group hears a rumbling noise, which turns out to be the Tofman tribe and their king marching over to the kingdom earlier than expected. The princess warns Vermilio and the others to leave through the rear gate, or they will be in trouble, but they hide nearby to observe the situation. The princess greets the Tofman king, who tells her he's bored and knocks her down. The Tofman king tells her that he wishes for conquest and wants to use the Aurelians as soldiers in his army to take over other kingdoms. The princess protests, saying this goes against their agreement to spare them if they surrender. However, the Tofman king brushes her off, saying that the agreement will hold if they fight and claim victory on the battlefield as well. The princess argues that her people are too weak to fight, but the king demands they get on his wagons or he will massacre them. Halleck jumps in and gets between the Tofman tribe and the Aralians, demanding the king to stop. Vermilio joins him, casting a firewall to keep the Aralians safe while Halleck prepares to take on the Tofman tribe. The king orders his soldiers to attack, but Halleck slaps them away with no trouble. Frustrated at his soldiers being useless against Halleck, the Tofman king takes matters into his own hands and faces Halleck. He punches Halleck, creating a cloud of smoke with its force. Everyone except Vermilio is afraid that Halleck has lost. The king then demands Vermilio to tell him where she's from, so he can ravage that place. Vermilio brushes him off, saying she will only fight him if he defeats Halleck. Right on cue, Halleck emerges from the smoke behind the king. The king is shocked that he survived his punch and launches a flurry of attacks, but Halleck is unaffected by them. Halleck punches the king back and launches him into the sky, defeating him instantly while everyone marvels at his strength. He demands the king to release the Aralians and never show his face again. The king stubbornly refuses, and Vermilio notices an aura emerge around him. The Tofman king grows in size, becoming more monstrous, and looks menacingly at Halleck, who seems unfazed as they get ready to face off again. The king strikes at Halleck, but ends up punching the ground as Halleck dodges his attack. The king continues screaming and punching the ground, appearing to have completely lost control of himself. Vermilio tells the Aralians to get to safety and leave the situation to her. Vermilio launches a fireball at the king, dismembering his arm, only for it to regenerate immediately. Halleck emerges from the cloud and stands in front of the king, while Vermilio feels she is too weak to fight the king herself. Halleck punches the king's arm, blowing it off again and Vermilio is amazed at how powerful Halleck is even without using any magic. The king stands paralyzed as his body starts crumbling to dust, and Vermilio realizes the battle is over already. We learn that the king used all of his life energy to boost his power. Vermilio speculates the reasons for the Tofman tribe's power boost, despite there being no toxin covering the land, and feels that something strange is going on. A Tofman soldier surprisingly thanks them, followed by the rest of them before they leave. Vermilio realizes that they were unable to defy their king the whole time. Suddenly, all the Aralians, 
having been freed from the curse, start glowing and transforming back to their original forms. The princess announces the end of the Tothman tribe's rule, and bows to thank Halleck and Vermilio. The princess asks them for their names, so her kingdom can remember their heroic deeds and songs and tales, and Peely excitedly tells them. The Aerlians celebrate with the group all night long, chanting their names in praise. The next morning, Vermilio gets ready to depart west, towards two large kingdoms, hoping to find a map that will lead her back to the Empire, as Halleck waves at the Aerlians, who wish them a safe journey ahead. A passing traveler informs them that the two kingdoms were destroyed after a violent war. He points them toward another town in the distance where they can learn more about the war. In the small town, the group encounters a mysterious lady by a fountain singing about a hero named Angus, so they assume she is one of the survivors of the ruined kingdoms. They find a map seller with a map of the empire, but he demands 50,000 len for it. Vermilio requests that the shopkeeper hold onto the map while they arrange the money. They sell off the crystals they received from the Aerolian princess, which only nets them 25,000 of the 50,000 len they need for the map. The two start thinking of ways to earn money quickly, when suddenly, they hear a person announce that there is a cooking competition with 30,000 len as the prize money. Vermilio realizes that Halleck can win with his skills, so she signs them up for the contest. Another contestant named Ajikaba joins in, and we learn he is the undefeated champion of the cooking contest. There are also other formidable opponents, like Munni the Mild Taste and Tuga the Spicy Sauce, who join the contest, and we see that the head judge is Master Rio Raiden, who is well known in the cooking world. The competition starts, and the theme is one pot dishes. The audience cheers at the dishes being created by the other contestants, while hardly noticing Halleck and Vermilio. The audience continues to mock them until they see how skillfully Halleck chops his vegetables, making it look like he's frozen in place. The other contestants are also intimidated by Halleck's skill, and Vermilio tells them how he won the Demon Lord competition. The competition heats up as everyone starts seeing Halleck as a serious competitor. Meanwhile, Peewee is listening to the mysterious lady singing by the fountain. We learn that Peewee went looking for popular foods to help Halleck and got lost in the process. The lady offers to help Peewee find the others. At the competition, it is time to taste and judge the dishes. All the contestants are confident in their dishes, making Vermilio nervous. Rio starts tasting the dishes. He scores Tuga's and Mummy's dishes 70 points each, and Ajikaba's dish 98 points, but when he tastes Halleck's dish, he scores it 120 points, making them the winners. Ajikaba is devastated and vows never to cook again, but Halleck praises him, which inspires him to improve. He gives Halleck his personal recipe book and departs on his cooking journey. Just as Vermilio thinks Peely is missing, he appears behind her and learns that he is late, and the competition is already over. With the prize money, they buy the map, and learn they need to head northwest to reach the Empire meaning they must pass through the ruined kingdoms on the way. The map seller warns them to avoid the abandoned kingdoms, but when they ask why, the lady from the fountain appears and informs them that a warrior of darkness prowls that area. We learn that the lady's name is Madame Iris, as she explains that crossing paths with the warrior of darkness means certain death. Despite the warnings, Vermilio decides to take the route anyway to avoid wasting more time. Before they leave, Madame Iris tells Peewee something, and then the group departs, soon arriving at the ruins of the kingdom. They walk through the ruins until Vermilio suddenly stops, frozen by a menacing aura. The sky darkens, and the warrior of darkness materializes. They try to run away from the warrior, but it catches up to them instantly. Just as it is about to attack, Halk swoops in and punches it away. Vermilio realizes that the warrior of darkness possesses the same aura as the Tothman king. However, her thoughts are abruptly interrupted by Halleck, who urgently instructs her to take Peewee and escape while he confronts the warrior in battle. Vermilio says she will return to help once she has ensured Peewee's safety. Halleck and the warrior start fighting, and Halleck is injured immediately. Vermilio is shocked to see Halleck struggle and realizes that the warrior draws power from a sinister source. She hurries to get Peewee to safety so that she can return to help Halleck. Peewee then notices something and we see that Halleck manages to break the warrior's sword. When Vermilio thinks the battle is over, the warrior regenerates his sword with the shadows. After hiding Peewee away, Vermilio returns while charging a powerful spell. 
She launches it at the warrior, who remains unaffected. However, her attack leaves the warrior wide open, giving Halleck an opportunity to land a strong punch on him. The warrior is thrown backwards by the force of the punch, but quickly recovers and teleports to Halleck, slashing him across the chest. The fight continues as Halleck and the warrior exchange blows. Vermilio notices Halleck slowing down due to his injuries. Vermilio speculates that the warrior is enchanted with a spell similar to the one used by Zudra, and believes they cannot defeat it without finding the spellcaster. She attempts to flee from the warrior until they can figure out a plan to defeat it, but Halleck emerges from behind them and attacks the warrior, and starts beating him. Vermilio notices something is off about Halleck and remembers the Great Witch's warning. She yells at Halleck to stop, but he ignores her. Peewee appears and starts chirping a song, which helps the darkness subside and causes the warrior to stop being hostile. Peewee explains that Madame Iris advised him to sing that song in case they ran into trouble. Back to his usual self, Halleck walks over to them, and Vermilio checks to see if he's okay. When she tries to heal him, Halleck stops her and uses his super recovery mode to heal himself. The warrior of darkness gets up and starts walking away. The group follows him all the way to the ruins of a castle, where several corpses lie. The warrior speaks, explaining that the kingdom only wanted peace, but seeing their loved ones getting murdered enraged them into waging war against the other kingdom. The conflict escalated, and forbidden magic was unleashed, transforming the knights into monstrous beings that slaughtered the kingdoms. In a desperate attempt to protect the survivors, the warrior of darkness was compelled to use the same magic to fight back. However, the people he sought to defend perished, and he descended into madness. The warrior expresses gratitude to the group for freeing him from the curse of darkness, but as he crumbles to dust, he notices Halleck's weapon and advises him against possessing it. He then gives Halleck his cursed sword to aid him in future battles. In his final moments, the warrior requests the group to sing the song again. However, just as Peewee starts singing, Iris stops him and expresses her desire to sing it. She reveals that she followed the group out of curiosity, and is happy to see that they saved the warrior from the curse. She walks over to the warrior and hugs him. We learn that his name is Angus, and he is her older brother. Angus is shocked to see her alive, and Iris explains that even though the Hex deprived him of awareness, he still managed to protect her and save many people for their kingdom. Halleck leaves with his group so the siblings can be alone, as we hear Iris singing for Angus one last time. The group continues onward and reaches the ruins of the next town. Peewee suggests they race across the walls, but Vermilio protests, saying it's dangerous. However, Vermilio eventually joins in. Peewee reaches a gap in the wall, and Vermilio laughs at him, thinking he lost. However, Peewee flies into the air and gets ahead of them, but while he's too busy celebrating, he flies straight into a monster's mouth. Back in the Empire, we see the winged knights and demons engaged in a fierce battle, with the demons easily winning. Ista watches the battle unfold and recounts the situation. We learn that the humans launched another attack on Castle Urim, but were intercepted by the defense forces. Azutra managed to retake the Demon Lord's castle with his special assault team, reinforcing the castle's defenses to hold against another invasion. Since the winged knights can resurrect endlessly, they keep launching continuous attacks, but the demons manage to fend them off each time. Knowing that humans will soon reach their full potential as heroes, Ista is anxious but she tries to have faith. Meanwhile, Han updates Azudra on the status of the battle, reporting that they have captured five knights. However, capturing more is difficult since they have countermeasures to avoid being captured alive and Azutra admits that the plan to capture the knights is not paying off well. Ista then enters to report her findings on the human's combat level. We learn that they have reached level 30, with their leader Edel reaching level 36. Han comments on the difficulty of raising combat level, and how the human's hero status is helping them progress quickly. Azutra suggests reinforcing the army, or they might start taking casualties, but knows that they lack the numbers. Ista reports the results of the Demon King's combat level evaluation. We learn that Hyura is at level 52, and their other soldiers are around level 40, so Azutra is reassured that they will be able to hold out for longer. Azutra senses something, but he brushes it off and proceeds to perform his daily ritual to locate Vermilio. Rocco expresses concern that Azutra is exhausting himself by using magic every day. 
Azuja reassures her, insisting that he is perfectly fine. However, Han argues that he is lying and is actually quite weak. Rocco advises Azudra to take it easy for the sake of the troops' morale. Azudra assures her that he will perform the ritual less frequently if he fails this time, but Han once again accuses him of lying, and Azudra tells him to be quiet. We learn that Azudra has been performing the locator spell daily to keep track of Vermilio and ensure her safety. Azudra begins the ritual and is surprised to see when the doll lands within the map, confirming that Vermilio is getting closer. Azudra immediately requests a detailed map of the region to pinpoint Vermilio's exact location. Meanwhile, we see the winged knights arguing in their castle, while Asta watches them. Asta learns that the knights aren't focused on winning and have other goals in mind. The knights end the meeting, but one of them senses Asta in the shadows and rushes over to find her. Asta hides in time, and the knight thinks he must have just imagined it, but Asta figures that their hero abilities are growing sharper as they couldn't sense her before. Back at the castle, Han assembles a small search party on Azutra's orders to find Vermilio. Based on her movements, Azutra sees that Vermilio knows her way back to the Empire. Ista asks them if Halleck is still with her because she is worried that he might turn out to be an enemy, but he reassures them not to worry. Han clarifies that Vermilio is either bringing Halleck back as an ally or not at all. Azutra expresses trust in Vermilio's judgment, as she had the opportunity to observe Halleck closely for a long time. Han believes that Azutra had trusted Halleck from the beginning, but he clarifies that even he isn't fearless enough to blindly trust him. However, his initial instinct was to have faith in him. Azutra then discusses his desire to resolve matters peacefully, acknowledging that there are good and bad people among all, including humans. We witness him reminiscing about an old friend who appears to be human. In the desert, Vermilio and the rest of the group engage in a battle against monsters as they make their way to the Empire. We learn that Vermilio has been trying to stop Halleck from fighting ever since he lost control in his last battle. Although she is convinced that Halleck is not an adversary, his immense power unsettles her. Halleck requests a conversation with Vermilio. After setting up a fire, we see Vermilio and Halleck enjoying some hot chocolate when Halleck shows her his short sword. We learn that the sword is broken and used to be a longsword called Hero Killer. Halleck explains that while the sword has lost most of its magic, it still has enough power to kill a hero. He then asks Vermilio to take the sword and use it on him if he loses control again. Vermilio admits to Halleck that she was initially suspicious of him but has changed her mind after observing him on their journey and refuses to take the weapon. Halleck explains that it's a favor that he wishes her to consider once he tells her everything about his past, the power of heroes, and the human realm. We see Halleck when he was eight years old and very poor, pleading with a lady to pay him more for his work, but she refuses and shuts the door. On his way back, he sees his younger brother Kles, getting bullied by older kids. Halleck tells them to stop, but they are arrogant because of their nobility status. They threaten him, telling him he must not defy them, Halleck agrees, but asks that they hit him instead of his brother, and they begin beating him up. We learn that Halleck and Kles were orphaned at a young age when their village was ravaged by monsters that killed their parents. Halleck took on the responsibility of caring for Kles, and the two headed to the royal capital to search for work, only to be abused by the nobles. After the bullies leave, Kles comes crying to Halleck, who encourages him to be stronger. Kles expresses concern about Halleck's injuries, but he reassures him by demonstrating his ability to heal instantly. In the present, Vermilio is shocked to hear this and speculates that he had awakened his hero abilities when he was just a child. Halleck then continues his story, and we see Halleck and his brother being regularly abused by the elites who would set fire to their home, throw away their food, or take their hard-earned money. Even then, it was impossible to leave because dangerous monsters were spawning outside the city walls. Despite their mistreatment, the two kept a positive outlook, hoping to leave the city when there were fewer monsters outside. Halleck wished to travel with Kles and find a more peaceful place to live. One day, Kles falls dangerously ill due to malnutrition, and a man from the slums tells Halleck that he won't make it through the night. Halleck blames himself for not providing enough food and sets out to find a doctor for Kles, planning to pay for it with his savings. The man tells him to give up, saying no one would help him, but Halleck is determined to save his brother. He carries Kles on his back and searches door to door for a doctor. 
No one in the city is willing to help them, but Halleck doesn't give up and tries to keep his spirits up by talking about their dreams of traveling. Kles continues to get weaker, and Halleck desperately begs the people around him to help, only to be harassed by them. As he is about to give up hope, a noble girl approaches him and asks what he wants, so he tells her his situation, and she runs off and calls for her father to help them. Her father takes them to his residence and gets a doctor to help Kles, who barely manages to survive. Halleck is deeply grateful to the father and after meeting these kind nobles, the brothers' lives change completely. Fifteen years later, we see humans desperately fending off monsters from infiltrating the city walls. The soldiers are too weak to fight them and are about to be defeated when Kles arrives and kills one with a single swipe. We learn that Kles is now the captain of the 3rd Infantry Regiment and is 18 years old. He leads the soldiers to charge at the monsters. The soldiers return to the town, and we see 22-year-old Halleck watching them from above. We learn that the man who saved them was a member of the Raffid family, who had supported the royal family since its founding. The girl who helped Halleck was named Shalami, the eldest daughter of the family. She visited the two after Kles recovered and became their friend. We see the other nobles stop harassing the brothers once they see Halleck and Kles being close with Shalami and her family. However, Kles is not satisfied knowing that other people still suffer in the slums. He thinks that the people are too worried about monsters to care about fighting the injustice of the class system in the capital. Kles decides to join the army when he grows up to bring peace to the capital by defeating the monsters. We see Kles training hard and learn that he joined the army at 16 and got promoted to the rank of captain at 18. Mr. Raffid comes to greet Halleck and they discuss Kles and his achievements. Raffid suggests that Kles may become the savior of the kingdom. As Raffid is about to leave, he turns to Halleck and tells him that he is strong enough to fight alongside Kles, which could increase their chances against the monsters. But Halleck says he's just an amateur and is better suited for labor work. While waiting for Kles to return, Halleck notices him with Shalami and wonders if they might be in love. The two notice him and they head to a pub to enjoy some drinks together. Kles tells Halleck that he might be headed for another expedition outside the capital and might not see him for some time. Halleck wishes him a safe journey and promises to cook him a nice meal upon his return. After Kles leaves for his expedition, more monsters start spawning near the capital, so the kingdom enacts a military draft. Halleck is sent on expedition where his group encounters a dangerous monster, which Vermilio determines to be a new world life form. Halleck tells her how terrified he was of that monster but stayed to fight it as his comrades needed him. Halleck focuses on bearing the monster's attacks instead of fighting back and realizes he can withstand its attacks. He changes his tactics and counterattacks the monster, exchanging blows until finally defeating it. After the battle, the squadron informs Edel that they can't help him anymore since their commanding officer and captain are dead. We learn that Halleck's squadron was assigned the task of saving Edel's town from monsters, as Edel himself had requested assistance from the capital. The squadron leaves, but Halleck decides to stay behind and accompany Edel back to his town. Upon reaching the town, Edel is devastated to see it has been completely overrun by monsters. Halleck tells him that it may not have been too long since the town was overrun, and there might still be survivors they can rescue. With this in mind, they proceed to offer their assistance. In the town, they search for survivors and come across a woman skillfully fighting off the monsters. They decide to join her in defending against the monsters. The woman is surprised to witness Halleck effortlessly defeating the monsters with his bare hands, but Halleck tells her that her swordsmanship is just as impressive. The woman explains that her sword is enchanted with magic specifically effective against monsters, which is how she fended off the monsters. She then asks Halleck to share his secret, but he humbly tells her that he used to work as a construction worker, but she assumes that Halleck is just playing dumb. Meanwhile, survivors approach Edel and inform him that the townspeople have been evacuated to the nearby castle grounds with the assistance of a group of mercenaries. We find out that several mercenary groups had formed, specializing in fighting monsters for money. We learn that the woman's name is Alicia, and she is the leader of the mercenary group that passed by when they noticed the town was in trouble. Edel asks Alicia to stay back and help his town, and she tells him that she will only be able to do so if Halleck joins her group, to which he agrees. 
Helic then spends his days fighting as a mercenary alongside Alicia, Edel, and their other companions, enjoying their time together. One day, Alicia and Helic are discussing their progress in eradicating monster nests when Alicia mentions how incredible Helic's abilities are. Alicia tells Helic that she comes from a family of mercenaries and that her grandfather was a hero who fought demons. She tells him that seeing his strength made her realize her own limits, but she still thinks he is amazing and can save more people than she ever could. She asks him to stay in her group after they are done saving the town. Helic continues to fight alongside Alicia for four years, but despite their efforts, the number of monsters doesn't seem to decrease. Meanwhile in the kingdom, they discovered the Demon Lord's castle during an expedition and announce a mission to kill the Demon Lord, suspecting the demons to be behind the rise of monsters, but Vermilio knows that demons are not responsible for all the monsters. The Human King assigns the task to Kles, who sets off to defeat the Demon Lord. As Halleck and the mercenaries discuss Kles, we learn that he is accompanied by the heavy infantry commander Zeruzian, the great sage Mikaros, and 5,000 soldiers. Alicia yells at the others to be more sympathetic to Halleck, but Halleck is confident that Kles will win. Kles defeats the Demon Lord three weeks later, stabbing him in his head. While the city celebrates his victory, Halleck rushes to see Kles and learns he was critically injured and poisoned during the battle. Mika Rose, the man who cured Kles when he fell sick as a kid, comes to see him, and we learn that he is the great sage who fought alongside Kles in the recent campaign. He apologizes for being unable to help Kles during the battle but promises to save him. Back in Edel's town, Alicia notes how the number of monsters remains the same despite defeating the Demon Lord. Everyone brushes off her concerns, but they turn out to be true when word reaches the kingdom that a horde of monsters is headed their way. The threat of the imminent attack leaves the citizens in chaos, who demand that Kles come out to fight the horde. Alicia tells Halleck to ignore them and help fight the monsters, but Halleck suspects that the Demon Lord may have resurrected and sent the monsters, so he decides to take matters into his own hands and kill the Demon Lord himself. We see Halleck walking alone towards the Demon Lord's castle. He walks through the destroyed remains and discovers strange mannequins resembling soldiers from the kingdom. At that moment, he senses a strong presence and follows it, only to come face to face with Azudra, who is wandering around the castle. Azudra is surprised to see him and tries to stop him from proceeding, but Halleck is determined to defeat him, believing he is the Demon Lord, but he falls right into Azudra's trap. However, Halleck manages to escape the trap unarmed, and Azudra fights back using his powers. Halleck relentlessly attacks him until he realizes that he is not the Demon Lord. Azudra tells him that the demons are not responsible for spawning the monsters and discovers that Halleck is not the hero who defeated the Demon Lord. Azudra explains that the Demon Lord's castle is just a small part of the Demon Empire and that he is one of the four generals who help rule it. He assures him that the demons have no intentions of waging war against the humans and tells him that the uptick in monster activity is due to the fallout of the siege on the Demon Lord's castle. Halleck is shocked to learn that the castle was actually preventing monsters from spawning. He asks Azudra why he's at the castle, and Azudra takes him to the burial site he made for the demons who died from the attack by the humans. Halleck asks him if he despises the humans for killing them, and Azudra says he does, but the demons were already aware of the risk when taking up the post. He explains that the demons hope to reforge their friendship with humans like they once had. The two discuss the relationship between humans and demons, and Halleck's perception of demons changes completely. He wonders why Kles would still fight the Demon Lord after learning the truth. Halleck asks Azudra whether peace between the two kingdoms can be established, and Azudra says it's possible, telling him about the competition for the next Demon Lord. When he returns to the human world, he sees the aftermath of a battle between the monsters and humans and rushes to the kingdom to find his friends. He is relieved to see them safe and sound and learns that the nobles have shut the city's gates, forcing the soldiers and mercenaries to face the monsters, resulting in the death of all the others. We witness Alicia screaming at a noble for closing the gates, and the noble tells her that their lives matter more. Alicia becomes enraged, and Edel has to hold her back. The mercenaries ask Halleck to check on Alicia and Edel, who are at the castle, demanding that the commander be held accountable for their actions. On his way to the castle, 
Halleck notices the citizens gathered around some demons who were captured during the siege and throwing rocks at them. Halleck becomes infuriated, and after some hesitation, he steps forward in front of the crowd, telling them to stop, but is only met with more aggression as they throw rocks at him. One of the demons tied behind him tells him to inform Azudra about the power of the new world that is hidden among the humans. He is abruptly interrupted by Mr. Raffid, who warns Halleck not to be fooled by the demons. But at that moment, the demons suddenly transform into monsters and attack the crowd, but we see three human soldiers emerge and swiftly defeat the monsters. Halleck is astonished by their formidable strength, and Raffid explains that they were blessed with the power of heroes, urging Halleck to have faith in him. Later, Raffid announces what they learned about the demon realm and explains his plan to defeat the demons by using the power of hero awakening. The artificially awakened heroes help fend off forthcoming demon attacks, and the kingdom, now safer, begins to prosper. Halleck is still unconvinced that the demons are evil but doesn't tell anyone about his conversation with Azutra. While hanging out with his friends, the mercenaries offer him and Alicia coupons to go on a date to a new restaurant, but Halleck doesn't understand it's a date and just thinks it's a chance to tell Alicia about his doubts. Alicia goes to get ready for the date, and Enel comes in to cheer Halleck on, who is still completely oblivious. Suddenly, one of Klasa's companions from the expedition comes in and urgently asks Halleck for help. But that's where this video ends. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.